Hello and welcome to the June 1st episode of APHA's 15 on COVID-19 series. I'm your host, Dan Zlot, Vice President of Education at APHA. Today, we are going to be talking about more hydroxychloroquine drama. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic just seems to be generating drama on a soap opera scale um, in the scientific community, and it has been fascinating and sometimes terrifying to watch. So let's go through um, an interesting paper that was published in Lancet and see what there is to be learned about that, as well as what happens when you inappropriately um, apply conclusions from data. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. As usual, I have nothing to disclose. And here are your learning objectives for today's episode. All right, so as I mentioned, there is more hydroxychloroquine drama. It has been in the news all over the place over the last week or so. And so um, there was a study that came out um, in Lancet, and this was a retrospective analysis which examined um, either chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine um, with or without uh, a macrolide antibiotic added on. and You've probably seen the results in the news, so we'll give you a high-level overview, and then we'll dig into the paper a little bit. Um, but here's what the study found. There was a higher risk of mortality in patients receiving chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine with or without a macrolide. And also, there was a higher risk of ventricular arrhythmia in patients receiving chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, again, with or without a macrolide. So... Does that mean we finally have the answer to the hydroxychloroquine question? We now know that hydroxychloroquine is dangerous. It results in increased mortality, as well as an increased risk of ventricular arrhythmia. Let's take a closer look and see if it's fair to make that conclusion. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about what this study was. So this was a retrospective multinational registry analysis uh, that consisted of data from 671 hospitals across six continents. So this was a large study. And in fact, it was a very large study. There were more than 96,000 patients included in the final analysis. Huge study. Uh, so where did all the data come from? Well, the data came from uh, a database repository that a group put together, and it's called the Surgical Outcomes Collaborative. And what it was, it consists of de-identified data that's obtained by automated data extraction from inpatient and outpatient electronic health records, supply chain databases, as well as financial records. So the way this works is that data was collected through an automated data transfer, and it captures 100% of the data from each of the institutions at a regular predefined interval. So uh, if you're familiar with the concept of big data, this is how big data is used in healthcare research. Now, um, a quick aside, as a researcher, um, if you happen to be in the field of research, this may be of great interest to you to know that these types of databases, these types of very large databases are available. Um, additionally, as a patient, um, it's always worth reading the fine print to see what exactly they're doing with your health information on your electronic health record uh, and to see what your options are. Sometimes you have the ability to opt out of having your data included in these types of things. Other times you don't. But either way, it's always worth being aware of what's being done with your health information, whether it's de-identified or not. All right, let's jump back on track. So um, in order to ensure data validity, a manual data entry process was used for quality assurance and to actually validate uh, the information in the database. So let's take a quick look at inclusion exclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria were all patients who were hospitalized between December 20th, 2019 and April 14th, 2020 at participating hospitals. Also, all patients had to be COVID-19 positive as confirmed by a PCR test. And finally, patients had to have clinical outcome recorded. And by that, the authors meant that they had to have a record of either hospital discharge or death in hospital. So moving on to the exclusion criteria. Uh, the first one was patients who had no record of a COVID-19 PCR test were excluded. Likewise, patients who had negative results on their COVID-19 PCR test were excluded. Uh, 
Uh, next was uh, an exclusion criteria aimed at minimizing opportunities for critique. So this was patients who started uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine more than 48 hours after the time of diagnosis. The idea there is that if you wait too long, the disease maybe progresses too long and you have worse disease. And so um, maybe that's influencing outcomes. So they wanted to eliminate that variable. And then uh, the next one was looking at patients who were on mechanical ventilation at the time of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine initiation. So they were excluded. And again, there was a VA study that came out a while ago that found somewhat similar results. There was an association in that particular study with hydroxychloroquine usage and poor outcomes. However, there was a discrepancy in the patient population between patients who were on mechanical ventilation uh, at baseline. And so, as you might imagine, being on mechanical ventilation is a poor prognostic factor, and so it's difficult to tease out, was it just selection bias? In other words, people who were sicker got hydroxychloroquine, and that's why they looked like they did worse. So the authors were trying to bypass that entirely and really to really get at the answer of whether or not hydroxychloroquine has any impact on the outcomes that we'll be talking about. And the last exclusion criteria were patients who received remdesivir. Obviously, remdesivir is a drug that's been demonstrated to have efficacy, and so they wanted to exclude that confounding factor. So patients were grouped into one of five groups, depending on which drugs, drug or drugs they received. So there was a chloroquine group, a hydroxychloroquine group, a uh, chloroquine plus a macrolide, and that was most commonly azithromycin, but it also included uh, clorithromycin on occasion erythromycin, and the same for hydroxychloroquine. And then everybody else was grouped into the control group. So now let's talk about the outcomes from this study. The primary outcome they were looking at was in hospital mortality. They had a number of secondary outcomes, uh, and that included clinically significant ventricular arrhythmia during hospitalization. And they defined that as the first occurrence of a non-sustained, um, but at least six seconds in length, or sustained ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. They also uh, looked at progression to mechanical ventilation, the total hospital length of stay, and finally, the ICU length of stay. So we're going to see reporting out on a couple of these uh, in in the course of today's presentation. They did report out on the other ones. We skipped over the maybe the less important ones uh, for the sake of time. The statistical analysis. Now this is kind of interesting. So we're going to talk about some relatively advanced statistical concepts. So I'll talk about them at a high level uh, to avoid this turning into a, a statistics lecture. Uh, what they did is they used the Cox proportional hazard, hazard model to evaluate the impact of various factors uh, on risk of mortality and the risk of ventricular arrhythmias. And so uh, what they're doing is they just want to see how big an impact uh, does each of the various factors that they look at have on your risk of either mortality or ventricular arrhythmia. And then what they did is they used something called propensity score matching analysis to compare each of the four treatment groups, again, that's chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, with or without a macrolide in each of those, uh, to a matched control group for each treatment group. So in other words, they found a matched control group for each individual group. It wasn't a matched control group for all four treatment arms. Each individual treatment arm had its own matched control group. So why would you do this? So propensity score matching, the whole purpose of it is to attempt to minimize the effects of known confounding factors. So if you want to think about it graphically, the idea is to create an equal balance of risk uh, of known risk factors in each group so that there is no confounder that's weighing more heavily on one group than the other or would favor one group compared to the other. So um, without doing a prospective trial, it's about as close as you can as you can get to really controlling for um, confounding variables. Uh, so using this approach, uh, the authors reported that they were able to provide a very close approximation of demographics, comorbidities, d disease severity, as well as uh, baseline medications between the treatment group and the control group. So again, uh, they're using everything in their power to try to make sure that groups are as equal as they can make them. One thing to note is that uh, the extent of the adjustments that they made was not provided, and we'll talk about this again in just a little bit. All right, well, now let's talk a little bit about who the patients were that were included in this study. So there were uh, 96,000 patients who were diagnosed with COVID-19. 
Of those, uh, just under 1,900 were in the uh, chloroquine group, just over 3,000 were in the hydroxychloroquine group, uh, just under 4,000 were in the chloroquine plus macrolide group, and uh, just over 6,000 were in the hydroxychloroquine plus, plus macrolide group. Uh, and that leaves a little over 81,000 in the control group. The average age of patients across the entire study was just under 54 years. 46% uh, of patients were female, 54% of patients were male. And the authors reported that there were no significant differences in baseline characteristics or comorbidities between any of the groups. So we have a pretty well-matched patient population here. All right, well now let's talk a little bit about the outcomes from this study. So the primary outcome again that they looked at was the risk of in-hospital mortality. So we already know the overall outcome we talked about it already, but let's go uh, group by group. So uh, for each group is listed the hazard ratio and then the 95% confidence interval. Now the hazard ratio here is for the risk of in-hospital mortality. So if the hazard ratio is above one, that means that if you were taking the drug or the combination of drugs listed, you were at an increased risk of mortality. And keep in mind, since these are hazard ratios, uh, the magic number we're looking at here is one. So if the 95% confidence interval crosses one, that would consider to be not statistically significant. So for the chloroquine group here, we can see the hazard ratio is about 1.36, and the 95% confidence interval does not cross one. And so here are the rest of the numbers for hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine plus a macrolide, and hydroxychloroquine plus a macrolide. And you can see the hazard ratios and the 95% confidence intervals there, and all of the confidence intervals do not cross one, so they're all statistically significant. So moving on to secondary outcomes, which is the risk of ventricular arrhythmia. Um, there were others, but this was the one that was most heavily focused on in the paper. Here are the hazard ratios and the 95% confidence intervals for uh, each of the groups, again, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine plus a macrolide, and hydroxychloroquine plus a macrolide. And you can see um, relatively high hazard ratios, um, all things considered, and of course the 95% confidence intervals for the entire group uh, do not cross one and therefore, again, are all statistically significant. So from a study design standpoint, this study appears to be about as well designed as a retrospective study can be. Uh, we had a very large N, multiple institutions across multiple continents, well-matched control groups, and the authors did everything they could to control for confounding variables. So on the surface, it certainly seems like this is a very well designed study. We'll talk a little bit more about this in just a moment. As with many things, appearances can be deceiving. So let's talk briefly about the limitations of this study. So despite how well the study um, appears to be designed, it's still a retrospective study, and that will always be a limitation. And the reason for that is no matter what uh, efforts you take to try to control for confounding variables, there's always the possibility that there's a confounding variable we don't know about. And obviously, if you don't know about it, you can't control for it. Additionally, uh, sometimes weird things happen where confounding variables stack up together in unanticipated ways, and you can get uh, a, an order of magnitude difference when certain confounding factors are added together. And again, if you don't know about that in advance, it's impossible to control for it. So that will always and forever be the biggest limitation of a retrospective study like this. So um, bottom line, this study, despite how statistically significant the results were and how um, alarming potentially the uh, outcomes appeared to be, this is a hypothesis generating study only. And so um, I think let's turn to the authors because they actually summed it up very well. So here's what the authors actually have to say about the study. They say, due to the observational study design, we cannot exclude the possibility of unmeasured confounding factors. A cause and effect relationship between drug therapy and survival should not be inferred. Randomized clinical trials will be required before any conclusion can be reached regarding the benefit or harm of these agents in COVID-19. So that's a very nice way of saying that correlation is not the same as causation, but it's so easy to fall into that trap of assuming that a correlation equals cause. So 
uh, I mentioned a little bit about some of the appearances and maybe there's more to the story. So let's take a quick look at that as well. So as it turns out, there have in fact been uh, serious data integrity issues raised, whether they're there or not remains to be determined um, about this study. So in particular, uh, a group of almost 200 scientists and statisticians have called for the full release of the statistical methodology and the data set that was used to generate this paper to allow for a more in-depth peer review. And in particular, uh, this group of scientists and statisticians raised the following concerns. The first was that maybe there was an inadequate or inappropriate uh, adjustment made for known and measured confounders. So we mentioned earlier the authors did not provide this information. So without that, we can't tell if the adjustments that they made are reasonable or not. So that's one of the things that they would like to see. Additionally, um, when you do this type of big data research, it's very common, in fact, it's the norm, to release the machine learning code if you happen to use machine learning, uh, as well as to release the full data set in supplementary materials, whether those are appendices or downloadable files, databases, etc. And that allows for everybody else to go out there and basically perform the same analysis on the same data set that you, uh, you performed, and you should arrive at exactly the same results. That hasn't been done to date. Now this next point is really interesting. Um, the information about the contributing institutions um, and the countries they're from was actively denied. So people actually went to the authors and said, we'd like this information. The authors said no. Now the authors cited uh, privacy concerns, um, patient identification concerns, but that's really unusual. Unless you have an incredibly small number of patients coming from your institution, This is our, the data here is already being provided in a de-identified way. So, if the number of patients from a particular institution is so small that you can go back with the information in the data set and identify them, you know, that's unusual. Um, and so certainly raised some red flags and I think there's more, uh, more to be said about that. So we'll, we'll follow up on that over time and see what comes of it. Uh, the last major point was that the data from Africa um, are pretty inconsistent with the state of healthcare in Africa. In particular, the authors of this open letter um, point out that what appears to be an unrealistically high proportion of COVID-19 cases and deaths seem to occur in hospitals with capabilities that are pretty far outside the norm for the African healthcare system in particular, um, that these things occurred in hospitals with relatively sophisticated electronic medical record systems, relatively advanced monitoring equipment. You know, keep in mind what they were looking for here was uh, ventricular arrhythmias, and so that requires some relatively advanced cardiac monitoring, uh, which isn't necessarily consistent with the types of equipment and computer systems that they have in general across Africa. So that was a big point of concern. And the bad news doesn't stop there. There's actually confirmed data integrity issues. So the data that was originally reported in the study coming from Australia didn't match the information that was provided by the Australian government. And so some people pointed that out. And so it turns out there was in fact an error in the data. It was discovered and corrected. Uh, the authors reported that there was no impact on outcomes. However, um, as a previous researcher, researcher myself and just in general, um, when you find one significant error in data, you always have to wonder if there are more errors in the data. So without additional validation, I, I think there's a lot of suspicion about the quality of this data. So when we start looking at the impact of this study, it's been significant. Trials have already been halted. In particular, the WHO halted their uh, multinational study prospective randomized controlled trial of hydroxychloroquine uh, to review safety data. Um, many individuals, both you know, patients as well as practitioners are making different therapeutic choices than they might have otherwise. Um, and undoubtedly, because of the delays as people do these safety analyses, uh, results of some ongoing trials will probably be delayed. Uh, so that has real world ramifications for us, especially in um, the setting where we're all looking for answers. We're looking for good quality answers as quickly as we can. So this is another great example where understanding the limitations in study design or failing to understand the limitations of study design has real world consequences, again, given uh, the scenario that we find ourselves in. So what's the bottom line here? 
And the reality is that this study doesn't tell us anything we didn't already know from other retrospective studies. We knew these risks were there. Um, there may be significant data quality and methodological flaws with the study. So still to be determined, it may be that they're, they did a good job with things. It may be that there's significant flaws. So um, we will have to wait for additional peer review before we're able to really make that determination. And as always, and really one of the key purposes of this whole 15 on COVID-19 series is to help you um, as well as hopefully um, remind others that understanding study design and study limitations is essential to allow for pop proper interpretation and application of study results. So that will wrap up our 15 on COVID-19 episode for today. For this Friday, June 5th, we will be talking, taking a look at the remdesivir data that got remdesivir approved, uh, or at least earned it its emergency use authorization from the FDA. Uh, that information initially came out in press release form. The full study has finally been published in New England Journal. So we'll take a look at that data, take a quick look at their methods and make sure that they use high quality methods and see if there's anything additional to be learned. So with that, we thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you on Friday. Well, I'm actually going to interrupt our own episode, and actually I'm recording this on the evening of June 4th, 2020, and uh, we've had some developments, some breaking news that we felt was so important it needed to be included in this episode, so we revised it and we'll be re-releasing it. Um, so it turns out that uh, this afternoon, the authors of the study that we've been talking about throughout this episode, uh, as well as The Lancet, have actually retracted their, their paper. They retracted the publication. And the reason for that is that Surgisphere, which is the company um, that created and maintains the Surgical Outcomes Collaborative, which is where all the data for this study came from, uh, is refusing to release the data set. They're refusing to release the terms of their client contracts and uh, they're not allowing anybody to examine their server records uh, to ensure data integrity, that the methods that they used and the, um, if they use machine learning, that the code that they used to do the learning uh, was, was valid. Uh, and the reason for this is they cite that their contracts that they signed with all these organizations prevent them from doing so. And as mentioned earlier, uh, they're also citing confidentiality requirements and confidentiality uh, concerns. So, um, this is shocking. Um, as a result of all of this, the, the authors of the paper are now saying that uh, given all the questions regarding the validity of the data, they, they don't feel they can vouch for the veracity uh, of the data that was included in their own study. And if you've ever published a paper, when you submit, one of the things you have to vouch for is the, the veracity and the validity of your data, as well as you know what contributions you made to the publication. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to process the, the full impact of this. Uh, if you think about this, either way, regardless of what, whether the study is accurate or whether it's inaccurate, the, the, the ramifications of this are just almost mind boggling. Uh, if the study was true, you know, if the, the, the results from the study are in fact accurate, we now have to wait even longer uh, to confirm this because this study, nobody can believe it anymore. So someone else has to go back and do another analysis to reconfirm this data. And in the meantime, if, and I'm saying that, if the results of the study were accurate, people are being exposed uh, potentially to, to a harm. Um, and so again, you know, there's, it's a retrospective analysis that we went through all the limitations, but, uh, not being able to rely on this data is just, it, it's shocking. And on the flip side, if this study is not accurate, as we talked about, think of the impact that this has already had. Studies have been stopped uh, and we all desperately need reliable, valid, well-designed trial data to help us assess whether or not hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine uh, has a role in treating COVID-19. And potentially now those results have been delayed because of the results of this study. And so as a result, again, we're left not knowing and potentially exposing patients to a risk or on the flip side, if there's a benefit uh, to hydroxychloroquine, we're not giving people hydroxychloroquine because there hasn't been a proven benefit. Um, so 
this is stunning. I mean, this is incredibly, it's a huge deal in the world of science and especially in a time of crisis like this. It's, it's really sad to see something like this happen. Uh, so we felt it was really important to make sure that this was conveyed and that you had this information as part of uh, the analysis that we talked about. So, um, We'll, we'll stop here uh, and proceed on with the rest of the episode, but um, did, did want to make sure that you were aware of that. As always, if you have questions about COVID-19, please send them our way. We continue to receive great questions from our audience, so thank you so much for that. Uh, we hope that you found this information helpful, and we hope to see you on Friday.